in three, two, one. And we are now live. Hello, I'm Scott Kuhn. I'm an award-winning short story writer, author of the YA sci-fi adventure, Lost Helix, and a former US Army intelligence analyst. My work can be found in Bewildering Stories, Mobius, the Journal for Social Change, the STEAM Journal at Claremont University, amongst others. It's good to be here. Today, I will be reading an excerpt from my book, Lost Helix, uh, published by Dancing Lemur. My thanks to Dancing Lemur, and also to Corin Khan for having me here today. Now I'd like to read from the, uh, the summary from the back cover. Stuck on an asteroid mining facility, DJ dreams of writing music. His dad is a corporate hacker, and his best friend, Paul, intends to escape to become a settler in a planet-wide land rush, but neither interests DJ. When his dad goes missing, DJ finds a file containing evidence of a secret war of industrial sabotage. <clears throat> a file encrypted by his dad using DJ's song, Lost Helix. Caught in a crossfire of lies, DJ must find, the, find his father and the mother he never knew. When the mining company sends Agent Corman after DJ and his Vergazi guitar, DJ and Paul escape the facility and make a run for civilization. Will DJ discover the truth before Corman catches him? Read the book to find out. Of course, there'll be a link below. In this excerpt, DJ is hanging out with his best friend, Paul. Paul is a system kid, which means he lives in the space station's orphanage. In the prior scene, his fellow system kids celebrated Paul winning a big game for their space, space station's high school. Therefore, he won it for all the system kids. And now I will read an excerpt from Lost Helix. After the system kids finished their celebration, DJ waited while Paul changed. Then they headed to DJ's empty apartment for an unsupervised night of violent video games. As the elevator whooshed them, toward residential level nine, Paul made an announcement. I've decided not to wait. I have the money and I don't need their worthless diploma in the mining arts. After the championship, I'm bouncing out of this human habit trail. For the first time in their lives, Paul's pipe dream felt real. He could feel it already, alone. He tightened his jaw. Have you even figured out how you're going to get off the station. They bring our food in by drones and the shuttles are locked down. Did you come up with something else? Paul grinned from ear to ear. Oh, don't you worry about that. Unlike school, I've been studying for this. There are more ways off this station than you think. It's more a matter of choice at this point. I'll be sending you a hollow from New Green. New Green. DJ couldn't imagine a place like New Green where you could go outside without a pressure suit and walk around under a sky. It would be strange. It would also be strange to be here without Paul. Paul was right. His dad was right. DJ needed to figure something out before Black Mountain figured it out for him. He didn't want to be a miner, but he didn't want to be a farmer either. But how could he become anything else? He didn't know. DJ managed the meager smile. I hope I get that message, but I don't want to see you see your body floating outside my window. Paul snorted. You'll never see my body floating outside your window. I'd aim my body at the corporate center and try to smash in an executive's window, all big and flashy the way I like it. You should come with me, DJ jerked his head back. What, smashing through a window? Paul smacked DJ's shoulder. No, Jack Knob, to New Green. What do you have keeping you here? Not like you have any plans or girlfriend or money or friends besides me, really, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if I don't, even if we didn't, even if we don't die getting there, you can't tell me what I do for a living. Even if I had the money for a lander, I don't want to be a farmer. I mean, the ride in would be fun, but he pictured Paul falling out of the sky in one of those landers riding his ugly metal box down onto unspoiled prairie, unfolding it into a homestead 
and plowing the surrounding plains into farmland. What DJ didn't see was himself. Before Paul could answer, the elevator doors opened, and there stood Brian Hochstein. As his gaze met DJ's, Hochstein's mouth dropped open. DJ furrowed his brow. What are you doing here? Is my dad home too? Hochstein looked away. I, my mission was canceled. Derek, your dad, he, DJ looked past Hochstein to where Mrs. Schumer stood in the hallway in her flowered moo. Her current crop of babysitting jobs peered out from behind her. DJ's own apartment door stood wide open. What the hell was going on? He pushed past Hochstein and stomped down the hallway. Paul and Hochstein followed. Inside, DJ found Agent Corman overseeing two technicians as they hunched over holographic screens projected from the interface nubs plugged into the apartment's walls. The techs copied everything in the apartment's computers to stacks of data chips for later analysis. Corman didn't, <clears throat> Corman didn't turn to see who stood behind him before saying, I told you to go home. Uh, I told you to go home, Brian. DJ dropped a heavy foot, ringing the metal floor like a bell. What the hell is going on? Corman turned. A momentary expression of surprise appeared but vanished behind his well-practiced public relations mask. DJ, it's good to see you, son. I wish it weren't under these circumstances. Hochstein put his hand on DJ's shoulder. Your dad went out on his job. He hasn't checked in and we can't find his transponder signal. We don't know where he is. DJ's heart plummeted to his stomach. I'm sorry we have to be here, Corman said, but, but his words were a distant echo to DJ's ears. Because of the sensitive nature of the systems that Agent Fletcher worked on, we have to audit the apartment's files. It's standard procedure. DJ fought to keep his knees from buckling. Hochstein squeezed DJ's shoulder. Your dad is quite resourceful. I wouldn't be surprised if he turned up tomorrow, limping his shuttle into one of our stations. DJ glared at the agents. Are you even looking for him? No one answered. Paul shoved his way in from the hallway with his fists quivering at his sides. You jackknobs, you just want your precious company files. You're not even looking for Mr. Fletcher, are you? Is the return on investment not big enough to bother to save his life? One of the techs informed Corman that they were done. Hearing that, Paul ordered, everyone get out of DJ's apartment now. On his way out, one of the techs bumped DJ's Bergazi off its stand, but Paul caught it before it hit the floor. Paul glowered at the tech until he exited the apartment. Finally, the agents and techs had retreated with their data, leaving them alone in the empty apartment. Tears streaked down DJ's face. I can't believe them. Mr. Mr. Hochstein is dad's best. He was supposed to be my dad's best friend, but no one is even looking for him. No one. Shoulders squared. Paul planted himself in front of DJ. No, someone is looking for him. DJ's brow twisted. Who? We are. DJ wiped his face, giving himself a moment to grasp. Paul's suggestion. And how are we supposed to do that? Where was he going? I never know where he's going, DJ sighed. It changes half the time anyway. Paul snapped his fingers. What about the shuttle logs? I bet you could get into them, DJ shrugged. I could get into the shuttle, into the shuttle logs, but not from here. He sat on the couch and brought up the computer interface on his hollow vision. What are you doing? They care more about their files than my dad, DJ snarled. So I'm finding out what they cared so much about. He wrote and ran an audit program that would list the apartment's files by size and date. As it ran, he started writing another, a more analytical program. But the first program completed before he could finish, filling the air with an esoteric matrix. TJ stopped typing. I think I already found something. What? Look, 
DJ enlarged the grid of colored blocks tagged with dates, sizes, and other details. Paul cocked his head. Now I'm looking at this block here, DJ zoomed in. This was a big old file. You can tell by, uh, never mind, it's complicated. But whatever that file was, it was here at least five days ago, or it would have been purged in the clean. Paul shrugged. I barely pass keyboarding, so whatever you say, buddy. DJ leaned back on the couch and stared off into his own thoughts. Someone deleted a big file that was at least 12 years old, and it was hidden inside a maze of folders. Paul dropped beside DJ on the couch. You think it was them? DJ rubbed his eyes. I don't know. It could have been them or my dad. Can you get the file back? No, those jerks deleted the whole restore folder. There had to have been something in there or they wouldn't have done it. DJ drove his fingers through his hair. Was this file anything at all or was it nothing? It didn't feel like nothing. Paul sat up. Okay, what's next? How do we find your dad? If DJ wanted to find his dad, he needed to start from the beginning of his dad's last assignment. Do you know anything about the shuttle bay modules? Paul answered with his silly grin. Well, that's the whole reading. So if anybody wants to throw any questions my way regarding uh, what I wrote here in Lost Helix, I'd love to he hear about it. One thing I can tell everybody is that um, the people that have read this book really, and then talk to me about it, they really connect with the characters in the way that I want them to. For example, uh, Agent Corman has his own personal philosophy uh, about how he's living his life. He does not see himself as a bad guy, but everybody ends up really disliking him. He sees himself as a uh, as the caretaker for Stone River, which is the asteroid belt where DJ is living. And um, so it's his job amongst other things, to prevent contract deserters from, make, from uh, escaping their jobs and heading back to uh, civilization. Because if you quit your job, you can't really quit your job. And if you get fired, you can't even find another job in the space station. You have to, to and no, there's not like another space station is gonna hire you. You just kind of hang out in the hallways until you end up being arrested, then put back to work for free. And, uh, so it's his job to keep people from escaping their contracts and going back. And uh, another, and he sees himself as integral to maintaining Stone River, and Stone River is integral to building humanity's future. So he's ensuring humanity's future. He's doing it at the expense of the actual humans alive today, but I got a question here. Uh, do you think that complexity of character is important for making the characters relatable? Uh, yes, if they're an important high level character, if they're uh, going to be a driving character throughout the book, then yes, you absolutely have to give them some complexity. But at the same time, you can also build character into the world by giving character to the well, what would be the NPCs of your novel? Um, so, for example, at one time, at one point, DJ's just being shuffled through these stations to get stuff for life. Just like it's just a bureaucratic process he's being run through, and you can tell exactly what kind of person, or at least what kind of day each person is having as the process continues for DJ. So, you know, you can have a very shallow character that's uh, also a rich character, 
But if you're going to have a character that's going to spread over an entire novel, then you definitely have to give them some depth. And I'm, personally, I'm a believer in uh, that nobody is considers themselves the villain of their own story. So um, even gangsters would justify themselves and think that they're doing right by the community and you know the government's not doing the right thing. So yeah, that's why villains are important that you create, that they're not just, <laughs> I'm evil doing evil things. No, they feel like they have a goal. And even if they're doing evil things, they're justified in the evil things that they're doing. Uh, another character that you did not get to meet, you got to meet DJ in this one, you got to meet Paul. They're both uh, important characters. DJ is a point of view character. And so is uh, Hochstein, you actually get to meet him. And, uh, <clears throat> and then you also would, if you read the book, you'll get to re meet Maya. Maya is uh, another person running away from uh, like basically a contract deserter, but she's underage, so she's not even under a contract. And uh, she runs off and they run into her. And uh, a lot of people really connect with that character. So I strongly encourage you guys to get into this book and meet all of the characters. Um, what is the main inspiration for this story? Well, to be honest with you, uh, none of my stories have a singular inspiration. Um, I start with what I like to refer to as seeds. So I'll have like a stupid little story seed like in, um, Civilization, the video game, science ending, you get the dome ships that uh, you can use to send out to colonize another planet. And that's your science victory. If you get to that planet before somebody destroys your civilization or what have you. Um, I was like, I always thought, well, what happens once those domes get there? You know, you've got this huge multi-generational -gener expensive ship that you've just flown halfway to whoever, wherever, you know, it's been going for light years. And, you know, of course, the first thing the colonists would probably do is strip it, strip the innards for parts and use that to build, you know, the foundation of their colony. But there's still a big giant ship up there unless you're going to drop the whole thing on the planet. In uh, Lost Helix, I give my science vessel from um, civilization a second life as uh, farm ships. So the cities that were in them are gone, and now there's just farms, and that's what's feeding the miners of Stone River. Uh, another inspiration was just the same kind of thing that inspired Metropolis, the old black and white movie. That it's a wonderful classic. I own it on DVD. Uh, it's like the imbalance of uh, power between um, corporations and workers and how that's bending towards something that has been referred to as corporate feudalism, which is a theme throughout this book. Um, what else was inspired? Uh, I also am inspired by actual science. Uh, I watch a lot of documentaries. In fact, um, I wrote a paper on how, as a writer, it's a good idea for you to be a jack of all trades. So, you know, the old adage, no, write what you know. Well, if you know a little bit about everything, you can write a little bit about everything. Um, forgot where I was going with that, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, so there's, uh, who else is in this book? You, you get to meet DJ's dad and you get to find out what that file was. Um, any other questions from the audience? Well, what else? Uh, I can tell you a little bit about my other work. If you go to my, uh, if you go to lostelix.com, which is linked to below, uh, you can find, um, you can all, that also links to scottcoonsci-fi.com, which contains all of my published works, including my award-winning short story, uh, Enduring Winter. If you go over to my YouTube channel, you'll find a link to this video, of course. And you'll also find a reading of me reading um, Enduring Winter, uh, which has won a couple of awards and was published in, Bil in Bewildering Stories.
So uh, a little bit more about um, DJ. Uh, well, let's, I'll tell you a little bit more about Stone River actually. Let, Stone River is out past uh, a place called Middle Black. And that's basically a space station that's orbiting nothing. And it stands between planet Hestia, which is basically civilization and um, Stone River, which is orbiting around a red dwarf. If you're a science fiction writer, always include some red dwarfs if you're going to go from star to star. Because in our uh, in the Milky Way, red dwarf stars are actually um, the most numerous. Our yellow uh, sun is uh, unusual. Looking for further questions or comments, not seeing any. Uh, Some other short stories I've written. Um, let's see here. What other short stories have I written that you guys would like to hear about? Oh, Workforce Drive, which is actually set in the same universe as uh, Lost Helix. It, all my uh, published works are available on my um, website, scottcoonsci-fi.com on the published works page. So in addition to, uh, oh, I know what I was talking about before, uh, the jack of all trades thing. It was, um, I watch a lot of documentaries. I watch documentaries about all kinds of things. I know entirely too much about the evolution of the modern grocery store. Uh, but I mostly watch uh, documentaries about physics. Um, I find them fascinating and also astronomy and all the crazy things that are out there in the universe. And one of the things that I can tell you is uh, warp drive is actually a possibility. We don't have the ability to make warp drive right now. The way that da Vinci did not have the ability to make a helicopter. He could imagine a helicopter, but he couldn't make a helicopter uh, because he just didn't have the associated technology of um, an engine to drive the propeller to lift the machine. So without that, uh, he could imagine a helicopter and say, well, if I could get two guys who were strong enough and they could run fast enough, we could make this thing fly. Yeah, but you can't do that. There's not two guys strong enough. And we have worked out theoretically how we can go faster than light. Uh, I actually have in my story uh, a couple of different faster than light engines. Uh, one's on a ship that you'll get to meet called the Smedley Butler, named after a great American hero. Uh, the Smedley Butler actually fires an antimatter matter ray that destroys a little piece of the universe and pulls them forward into the extra void void. Um, it's kind of like if you were using a laser to boil away water in front of a boat so that when the water sank into the absent hole in the ocean, the boat would be pulled forward. It sounds incredibly um, inefficient. And yeah, it is, it is. It's an old fashioned uh, spaceship that we're dealing with in this one. Uh, another book that I'm uh, published in that I can tell you about is It Came From Her Purse. Uh, that's available on Amazon and other where, and everywhere that books are sold, of course. I am uh, a contributor to that one. It's an anthology. It's called, my uh, contribution is called Tangled Fate. And I think you'll enjoy it. It's a comedy about yo-yos. Uh, the one that I had published for Mobius, uh, the Journal for Social Change. Uh, yeah, that's what it's about. Uh, it's called Pirate Hot Dogs, and it centers around a food truck called Pirate Hot Dogs. And the police who, can't, who are trying to stop them from selling hot dogs. It's, and it's all in space, of course, because I'm a science fiction writer. Why wouldn't it be?
Let's see. All right. Um, another one that, another short story that's actually related to uh, Lost Helix that you guys might enjoy. And you can, like I said, you can find all of this at scottcoonsci-fi.com. This one's called Type 2 Agoraphobia. And I actually worked it into Lost Helix, the, the concept of type 2 agoraphobia that I came up with, which is someday there's going to be generations of people who are born on space stations. They grow up on space stations. They've never been outside except inside a pressure suit. And I think there's a distinct possibility that they will develop an agor a very specific agoraphobia to being on a planet's surface. And uh, what I'm predicting is they'll have this incredible sense that they're going to be ripped off the planet. They're going to, they're just going to fly off because, they, or they're not going to be able to breathe the air because they're on, because that's not what they're used to when they go outside. Outside is a vacuum. Uh, and this guy uh, in the short story, he has type two agoraphobia and it's impacting his ability to get married to somebody who lives on Earth. And he's been living in orbit around Earth the whole time. And this story, DJ and uh, Paul and basically any other kids from uh, Black Mountain Space Station 4 or any of the other space stations that are housing people out in uh, Stone River, they all, they've never walked under a sky, not once. And uh, so, DJ is going to be warned that, you know, if you actually make it to a planet, you might suffer from this. Paul, Paul is also potentially uh, uh, able to suffer from this, but yeah, I think his personality basically excludes it. So I like to... Uh, you know, I think like a lot of writers, I like to revisit uh, same ideas, uh, but in different ways and different stories. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut definitely did this. I loved uh, Kilgore Trout. My favorite Kurt, I loved that in Kurt Vonnegut's um, Breakfast of Champions, Kurt Vonnegut has a conversation with Kilgore Trout, who is basically just a disheveled Kurt Vonnegut. All right, well, we're almost out of time. Uh, I don't see any more questions coming up. A couple of comments, but not any questions. So I'm gonna just keep telling you all about some of my short stories. Uh, another short story that I wrote, did a YouTube video for is Happy Pills and Candy Bars. I'm actually quite proud of my videos on YouTube. Uh, they're extremely low budget. And I invite you to politely make fun of them because uh, as a friend of mine called it, uh, they're like the best, the best presentation in an eighth grade book report. And I take pride in that. I'm, I'm very happy that I achieved that level of eighth grade book report top dog. Uh, because what's really important is the stories and the, the rest of it's just there to hear it for you to listen to me reading it. So Happy Pills and Candy Bars are about a guy going stir crazy in deep space and his mining shuttle gets, or his mining vessel gets called on a distress. So uh, they go to rescue him and nothing goes right from there. All right, so thank you very much. I'm gonna, coming to an end now. I, I much appreciate your time. I hope you all enjoyed this reading. Thank you for uh, tuning in.